Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Gorgeous verse from chapter 19 of verse of Revelation, and we're going to get there, I hope, uh, in today's Bible study. Uh, we're going to continue where we left off last week uh, by beginning to read it for chapter 18, uh, and then we'll at least get into the beginning of chapter 19. Thank you for joining me. Let's pray before we, we talk. Our Father, we do thank you for your word, for your living word. For a word that speaks of things as yet not seen and yet full of promise. We pray that we may catch on to that hope which you would sow in our hearts and that therefore we might live by faith and be faithful in this time and in time to come through Christ our Lord. Amen. When we are reading the book of Revelation, we are reading, of course, a series of visions and teachings. <clears throat> and they certainly make demands on us. They ask us to picture things that perhaps are far out with our ordinary experience. And they layer again and again, almost on top of one another. So when we pick this up in, <clears throat> in chapter 18 today, we're continuing from, well, a section that began at the beginning of chapter 17, a picture of a woman seated on a beast. But this is very quickly interpreted as, as a city, as, a, as an empire, as the source of what leads people sadly down a path of self-indulgence and excess and unfaithfulness, committing adultery, so to speak, by going off other, after other gods, pledging one's allegiance, really one's heart, certainly one's time and one's commitment to, to things really that do not bring glory to God, nor indeed bring joy and real happiness to, to human beings. In fact, alas, sometimes they're the source of great unhappiness and the source of pain and the source of, of struggle. So chapter 17 was a, a very vivid picture of how the Lord would not, in the end, allow this to be the way things will be. In fact, the Lord will destroy, overcome, because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And we're really rather in the middle of this. So let's just go straight to the text and we continue reading, really in sequence, going on from where we left off at the end of chapter 17. The help that the, uh, the visionary John is being given is help from angels. The angels are showing him what he is to see, what he is to understand. So I'll bring up the text and we'll, we'll follow that together. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Now, I'm certainly not going to stop at every slide, but, but just there at the very beginning, here's in a way almost a summing up of where we've got to, or if you like, a seeing again of what exactly we're talking about. The fall of Babylon the Great. Babylon, a symbolic title for, really for that kind of empire, that way of thinking, that way of living, that way of doing, that is utterly hostile and empty in the sight of God. And these chapters are soaked with the language of the Old Testament because, well, particularly in the book of the prophet Jeremiah, that the first fall of Babylon was anticipated in prophetic witness. And a great deal of language is taken from Jeremiah, not least chapters 50 and 51. But here at the beginning, you see a, a city is actually now filled with, so to speak, desert animals. 
you know, the, the, the beautiful civilised trappings of city have been overtaken by, by decay, by what uh, certainly doesn't make for a beautiful civilization. Wine brings maddening thoughts, causes maddening action, or rather detestable actions, really. Uh, excessive luxury, adultery, none of this is good, yes? So, like I said, not to stop at every slide, but uh, I, I just wanted to pause at this first one, and then we're kind of in gear, so to speak, I hope, for the rest. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as queen. I am not a widow. I will never mourn. Therefore in one day her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning and famine. She will be consumed by fire. For mighty is the Lord God who judges her. So a little pause there. Uh, the stubbornness of Babylon, the, the, the feeling that they're invincible, so to speak, uh, that's coming out. The Lord's judgment against it, that's coming out very strongly. The Lord will see this through. This will not last. And the other very strong word there in verse 4 is that the people of God, the people of faith, are, if they are not careful, rather embroiled in all of this, caught up in all of this. And that was certainly always the danger, even in the first century. And it continues to be the danger now that we collude with, we, we compromise with, we settle for the kind of stuff that goes on in our world that really does no one any good, and least of all is of service to God. And so we have to be very much uh, spoken to by John in this letter that, yeah, we have to be quite careful. We really do have to, to keep as far as possible out of being corrupted and dragged down. Now, actually, it's very hard, extremely hard, to do that with 100% success. But the word there is to certainly to, to do all that whiz within our power and all that we possibly can do so that we do not share in the sinning that so marks the, the Babylonian world, so to speak. <clears throat> Now, for the rest of chapter 18, there are, there's a series of visions where uh, there is uh, yeah, lament by those who will be deeply affected by the fall of Babylon. Those who have, as it were, put all their eggs into that basket. Those who have absolutely loved the, the life of, of hedonism and of excess and, and even when it's cost the lives of other human beings. So let's read this. We're going to read a, a quite large section there, and then we'll have a wee look at it. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe! Woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon! In one hour your doom has come. That's kind of one tableau, the kings of the earth, seeing the, the, the awfulness of it all and realising the time is up. Now the second tableau, so to speak, the merchants of the earth. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk and scarlet cloth. Every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron and marble. Cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages, 
and and human beings sold as slaves. Notice that one, because in that world of many luxury goods flying around and some people having an absolutely wonderful time in that Babylonian world, there was a real human cost. In fact, the, the Roman Empire, certainly in the first century, would not have been able to flourish had it not been for the market in slaves. And actually, it has forever been so. Wealth has been accumulated, but so often with horrendous human cost. And nowadays we're so aware of that. You go into any historic stately home and you need to know now, actually, some of the money that went into the making of all the luxury we see is, is tainted, tainted money. And uh, in the world in which we live nowadays, there are all kinds of people who are exploited either as slaves or in low, age, uh, in low wages or in being taken advantage of and working far too much. That world is going to end. It were still with the merchants. They will say, the fruit you longed for is gone from you. All your luxury and splendour have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. And Jesus, of course, very famously talks about us. Yes really needing to find our treasure, not in the things of this world. Our treasure, certainly not in the things of this world. Our treasure in heaven. And then a third tableau. In the ancient world, of course, every all the goods, all the, uh, the commerce uh, was done by sea. They didn't really do road travel very successfully in the ancient world. So there's a little tableau about how the sea captains will be affected by the fall of Babylon, by the fall of this empire where people live as if this life is the only thing to be lived for. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city, where all who had ships in the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour she has been brought to ruin. A real lament for what people absolutely believed in, that it will be lost. And then the end of the chapter. Rejoice over her, you heavens. Rejoice, you people of God. Rejoice, apostles and prophets. For God has judged her with the judgment she imposed on you. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said, With such violence the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. The music of harpists and musicians, pipers and trumpeters will never be heard in you again. No worker of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's important people. By your magic spell all the nations were led astray. In her was found the blood of prophets and of God's holy people, of all who have been slaughtered on the earth. <coughs> a picture of how a city has flourished, and yet, actually, part of the story of that flourishing has also been a story of, of evil, of wounding killing prophets, killing those who would 
see, this is not my world. This is not the way I want to live. Not at the cost of others. But blood has been shed. And so chapter 18 really finish, finishes, well, certainly with a sense that it's good that all the evil finishes, but there is a quite a poignancy, I think, quite a poignancy, a dwelling on what all could have been so lovely. That wherever there is loveliness, people have sometimes just pushed for too, too much and not been prepared to seriously count up the cost and, and how truly you cannot benefit yourself if it's going to be hurting others. So anyway, we go on to chapter 19 at this point. <clears throat> and now we're continuing in this mode of thinking, well, what is there if we can just once and for all, by the grace of God, know that all the evil, all the corruption, all the self-indulgence that hurts others will cease? So let's hear this. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servant. God's time has come. And hallelujahs are raised. It's quite interesting. In the New Testament, I was pointing out to the Bible study yesterday that uh, I actually hadn't realised it myself until I was reminded about it in the commentary that this is the, the first and the only time that this word hallelujah, which is, of course, a very prominent word in many of the Psalms in the Old Testament, this is the one and only time in the New Testament that the word hallelujah actually is is articulated. Now, that's not to say that people weren't singing hallelujah, hallelujah along the way, certainly as followers of Christ, I don't doubt that they were. But somehow it's been kept for this last book of the Bible, for this last book which is called Revelation, because hallelujahs in the end, hallelujahs in the end are, are completely unsung, without any sense of it's only going to last for a short time. We will praise the Lord forever and ever. His is salvation, his is the glory, his is the power. He is true and just. And all the, the wrong judgments, the, the wrong condemnations, the hurt undeserved that has gone on in the world as you and I know it, this will come to an end. Hallelujah. And again they shouted, <coughs> The great multitude, you remember? Like a great multitude, endless people will, will be rejoicing about this. Again they shouted, Hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen. Hallelujah. Gosh, that takes us right back to much earlier in the book. I think, was it chapter 5, chapter 7? With elders and living creatures. See what I mean about a layering of this book of Revelation. We, we have things quite early on that, in a sense, yeah, it's part of the whole story. Everything's part of the whole story. At the end, the words will be hallelujah. The Lord God reigns. Well, actually, I'm anticipating the text. Let's read it. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him both great and small. Indeed, that is the call to us as human beings, to praise God, to live for the glory of God. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. You know, we believe in the kingdom of God. We believe in the kingdom of God that even is now, because people even now, you and I even now, can acknowledge the Lord to be king, the Lord to call the shots in our lives, the Lord to be the good shepherd in our lives, the Lord to be the one who is truly just in our lives. Even now we can know that. But the time will come, the 
time will come when truly every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. When the Lord truly has become a king, never to cease being king. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. I'm going to sing this here in the book of Revelation. I, mean, I think we've been anticipating it already, haven't we? That, that the picture of the coming together of God and his people is a picture of a husband and a wife coming together. The Lamb, Jesus spoke of himself as the bridegroom. And at the heart of the most beautiful vision of a wedding is, is just utter happiness. Time standing still. Nothing could be better. I want to draw your attention to verse 8. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Note that, you know, the, the bride who is, so to speak, the church, and therefore you and I, <coughs> we ourselves cannot, as it were, dress up in white as if we deserve it but it will be given to us it will be given to us to be utterly in the end purified utterly in the end justified and saved actually we already know that but as we all know even as we have our hope in Christ as if, even as we want to live by faith in Christ for now we we sometimes seem to be just far too vulnerable. We we keep on sinning, at least inadvertently, sometimes even deliberately. It's awful. We keep confessing our sin. But the time will come one day when we shall be truly, truly clothed in white. To do what is right in God's sight, to be connected to God in our lives, that is God's gift to us. For us to receive and then to live through. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. It's actually a very slightly different image there, you know, because of, uh, to start with, we are, so to speak, the bride. And then we are, so to speak, the guests at the wedding. Just remembering Jesus' teaching about wedding feasts. It's a beautiful vision of what will come at the end. People always able to enjoy eating together, celebrating together, <clears throat> being invited to be part of it. Now, verse 10 is an interesting one. Just to be, This is the last one for today. At this I fell at his feet, this angel's feet, to worship him. But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters. Who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. Yes, it's always been tempting for people to think, well, the one who bears good news, the one who carries good news, the one who explains to them good news is, is well, not just a gift of God, but almost like God. And John is almost tempted there to worship. Uh, it happens at one or two other points in the New Testament, that sort of experience, just as it happens nowadays. And we have to be very careful, yes, because all of us together are servants of God. And uh, it's, worship is certainly not for any of us, any of us. But the beautiful thing certainly is to hold the testimony of Jesus. Jesus who bore witness to the love of the Father. Jesus who gave himself to die for us. Jesus is everything. And that's been the case from the very beginning of the book of Revelation. And here it is absolutely being affirmed now as we're getting near the end. You know, any prophetic spirit, he seems to be saying in verse 10 there, bears testimony to Jesus. Jesus brings everything together. All these Old Testament texts, really, they do point to Jesus. All this vision of what will be at the end, they, they lift Jesus up. Jesus is, Jesus is Lord. 
Well, that's as far as we got. We had quite a lot of discussion yesterday. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's more to come. But thank you. Thank you for listening. Let's pray together. And so, Father, we will thank you for your word. We will thank you for every way in which it, it lifts us and encourages us. And it certainly asks us to take steps to, to live in ways that are pleasing to you. To live seeking after righteousness. We pray you to forgive our sin. To forgive our failures. To forgive times that we really haven't even seen what we need to be careful of wary of, even distancing ourselves from. Forgive us our sin and allow us to turn towards you and to live by walking in and into your light. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.